Hi, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Climate Voices with our various climate activists from different parts of the world. Today, I'm so happy to welcome Elizabeth, a climate activist from Zimbabwe, and Destin, a climate activist from Uganda. I can't wait to hear from them and get to understand the things that they're doing uh, to help our planet and to help secure perfect future for everyone on this planet. So welcome Elizabeth and Christine. We are so happy to have you. Thanks a lot for having us. I'm so glad Thank to... you. Thank you so much, Vanessa. You're welcome. Uh, so I would like to ask Elizabeth to, you know, briefly explain to us uh, who she is and what she does. For example, if I, if I came and asked, who is Elizabeth, how best would you describe yourself? Okay, so Elizabeth is a young lady who just turned 30 years old today. And um, I've been doing environmental work, I think, for the last or for the past seven years now. Uh, basically, my work has been uh, on awareness, educating, educating young students on what environment is, what environmental conservation is, uh, how best they can tackle climate action. Then in 2015, we came up with a group of friends and we uh, registered an organization uh, from the Africa, African movement called African Youth Initiative on Climate Change. So we've been doing quite a number of projects, climate mitigation, climate change adaptation, improving and creating resilience communities, uh, action for climate empowerment. Yeah, I think that's me. Uh, that's really amazing to understand all the things, you know, that you're doing for humanity and for the people in your area. Um, I'd like to also welcome us to briefly uh, describe himself, tell us about himself and, you know, what he does in his country and, yeah. Well, thanks for this opportunity. My name is Mpija. I'm a climate activist from Uganda and uh, I'm working with Cherish Aid Foundation, a non-profit organization that is focusing on basically environmental activities and climate change in particular. And um, we, started, we, started our, we started our activism basically in schools and our communities um, with our project, uh, our main project, which is so famous, is the planting of trees. Trees, we always plant ten trees per week, and it's basically going on very well. We have been very welcomed everywhere. We are uh, uh, basically running on our hashtag Young People for Climate Action, and we are creating a good awareness in young people. Yeah. Well, I think you guys are really incredible climate activists that the world needs to hear, that the world needs to listen to so that they get to know what you're doing and the solution that you're offering for humanity, for our planet, for our future and for everything, you know. So I would just like to know why climate activism, why did you choose, you know, to do something about the planet or about our earth? Why, what inspired you? Why of all things did you choose to join the planet So, as for me, I studied environmental science. But besides studying environmental science, because there are two things, studying and being passionate about what you're doing. So besides studying environmental science, I had to go for internship when I was in my third year. When I was in my third year. So the organization I was attached to, uh, the uh, into environmental conservation, is called the Environmental Management Agency. So I was quite flexible and, you know, they would let me experiment with a lot of things. And my passion actually actually grew 
because I was attending and visiting most of the schools in my area. I think when I was doing my internship, I visited like more than 30 schools, educating students and how they can, you know, they can improve their projects. They can come up with resilient projects for their schools, be it trees, but uh, actually trees, they actually assist in food security, um, fish farming projects, land degradation, how they can improve that. But then when I finished my BSc, I later on realized that Zimbabwe was actually affecting and being affected by the effects of climate change, especially droughts. And a lot of animals were dying like elephants. They need a lot of water, but if you do not have enough water, uh, an elephant can actually die because of a lot of stresses within the environment. I was so passionate about it. I kept on reading about climate action and uh, boom, uh, it's, I, I'm here today and uh, I've been doing the work ever since then, ever since 20, 2012, I've been doing the work up to now. Wow. Um, you talked about something about educating. Why do you think it's important for us to have the young people educated about the issues, you know, that affect our planet? Okay, so why it's important is in order for us to create resilient communities, communities that are able to adapt to the effects of climate change, they should know and they should understand what climate change is. So you find out that most communities, they have been victims of climate action, but they might not necessarily know how to reduce the effects of climate change or how they can live with the effects of climate change. So I believe it is very important to catch children at such a young age, uh, educate them on the effects of climate change, how best they can be best stewards of their environment. When they grow up, they can be better people than us. So I feel like action for climate empowerment is very, very important whenever we want to start any project. What does a resilient community look to you? What does a resilient city or a resilient country look to you? To me, a resilient community is a community that is able to, to live with the effects of climate change and try to reduce the effects of climate change. For example, if you have realized that in your area you're facing a lot of droughts, then instead of growing a certain crop, you can diversify. You can come up with crops that are drought tolerant. So that is, that is what I call a resilient community. A resilient community is a community that is able to come up with ideas as a community, because when you're talking about climate change, we are not talking about individual efforts. So uh, we are talking about a united communities that are coming up together uh, working on different projects. It could be water harvesting, it could be fish farming activities, it could be food security through uh, tree planting, etc. That is my example of a resilient community. So uh, what you're trying to say is that we need to prepare communities for certain disasters that could happen as a result of climate change. Instead of us being um, reactive, when a disaster strikes, we need to be proactive. Have I got you right? Yes, because the problem that most African countries are facing is they want to react when they are affected by a certain hazard. But it's something that can be prevented. We can actually learn to live with those effects because these disasters, the hazards, they are, con they are, they are not going to stop anytime soon. We are going to have severe droughts. We are going to have cyclones. We are going to have uh, heat waves, even the desert locusts, we are going to have them if we do not change our behavior. So we, we need to create these communities to be able to live with those effects that are um, coming up uh, resulting to climatic changes. But you know, um, communities may you know, come up with all these uh, resilient measures and all that, but at the end of the day, it's the governments that are going to you know, input the solutions that we need in order to address this issue. I personally don't think that we should be uh, comfortable with the effects. Of course, we should be proactive uh, in the case of uh, those disasters. But then I think there is a possibility of actually having change and action taken so that we completely erase out the disasters that people face as a result of climate change. Yes, you are right. Uh, I, I would love to agree. Uh, so what we have done as an organization, 
we have managed to partner with the government. So it means when we are doing our awareness, climate change education, we are going together with the government. Uh, there is no project that we have done without our government. Our government have given young people 100% support when it comes to climate education, environmental education and environmental awareness. So yes, you're right. Uh, we need very good policies, structured policies that engage and involve everyone. And uh, we cannot rely on top-down approach, but it's also the time when we need to uh, actually appreciate the bottom-up approach, paying particular attention to indigenous knowledge systems, their role, uh, their, their role in the communities. <coughs> so we have worked with all participants, we've worked with all parties and other NGOs so that we can create resilient communities. That's really amazing. So at the end of the day, everyone has a part to play in order to save our planet. Because uh, with unity, that's the only way that we'll be able to overcome uh, whatever challenge that comes with climate change. So um, let's hear from this team, why, why climate activism? You know, there are different kinds of things that you would do, but why did you choose climate activism? What inspired you? Yeah, um, the reason, the main reason to why I decided to choose climate activism as the major emphasis in our organization is that um, me, myself, I grew up with a single mom who was an agriculturist and she was doing everything, um, paying for our school fees, feeding us as a family, just like you know from agriculture. But the challenge is that since I was childhood, since I was a child, I was seeing, I was seeing her hustling to the farm to, 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 to make sure that uh, he has uh, what to deliver on market, vegetables and everything and all that. But um, due to changes in the seasons, uh, remember in a period where we used to expect rain, we see a lot of sunshine. And in the period where we expect to see sunshine, we see a lot of rain. Sometimes it really distorted a lot in a way that she was so perturbed in her cultivation. She couldn't uh, cultivate very well. She couldn't, uh, sometimes we could find a problem of lack of food, food insecurity and all that. So she, so I was like, I, I really love researching. When I was researching, I realized that most of the major reasons to why seasons were changing, it was because of climate change. That was uh, when I was about to, that was uh, about uh, 2015. So I realized that truth, uh, all of the catastrophes that are ongoing that leads to food insecurity and all that, floods, they were due to climate change. So I had to research a lot about climate change. So when I realized uh, the, the causes of climate change, mostly uh, 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 the changes in the, uh, in the seasons, because in some months we used to expect a lot of, uh, in some months we used to expect a lot of rain, moderate rain, and sometimes we expect sunshine. But in those, So um, I think this team had an issue with his internet. So um, maybe as we wait for him, there's something that he talked about, about uh, his mom raising him as a single mother. And this really pushes me to understand how much these, uh, these women do in order to put food on the table for their children. And in the case or occurrence of climate disasters like droughts or flooding, they end up losing everything. So it really makes me think that women are the most you know, affected 
when it comes to climate change how i don't know do you do you agree with that elizabeth how do you really see that women are the most affected when it comes to climate change because i've seen in most communities it is women who have to make sure they put food on the table but what happens in the occurrence of a drought what happens in the occurrence of floods these women lose everything and yet they have to feed their children and their families at large. Uh, thank you very much for posing that question to me. Um, yes, you're actually right. From a policy level, that's right. We actually have a component to do with the gender and climate action under one of the negotiated topics, uh, UNFCCC, the gap which pays particular attention to women because they usually suffer when it comes to effects of climate change. And we also have the Dublin principles, which actually appreciate the role of women when it comes to water conservation and water use. So you find out that uh, in most cases, when we have uh, severe droughts, women have to travel long distances in fetch of water. They have to travel long distances in fetch of firewood. So they are vulnerable and they are mainly affected. Uh, even when it comes to opportunities, for example, if it's renewable energy, women are referred to as the end users of renewable energy, yet there is also a role for them to play in all the um, renew renewable energy value chain. Uh, there are actually opportunities that are there for women, but they are referred to as the end users of, of renewable energy. So that's why you see women are mainly affected by this, and it is quite important to take them along and empower them let them know that they actually have a pillar. I mean, without the women, we wouldn't have been here. We wouldn't have been having this meeting anyway. So it is actually important to, you know, empower the women and let them know that they um, actually have a big role to play when it comes to reducing the effects of climate change, which is climate change mitigation and ad adaptation of climate change. For example, we cannot talk about food security without talking about women because they spend most of their time in the field if we are referring to African countries. So yeah, that is a quite a very good point. So um, literally we cannot have uh, any change or we cannot drive any solutions uh, in the world without women being behind them because there is a power in them if most of them are able to resist and uh, you know survive certain occurrences for example the climate disasters and uh, they have to maybe walk long distances in order to get clean water for their children for their families including their husbands it really means a lot to have uh, the women um, held in this conversation of climate change because i believe that they have so much to contribute when it comes to addressing this issue. Yeah, 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 like I said, that is that is true. So um, what does climate change look like in uh, Zimbabwe? I've never been in Zimbabwe, but I know something is happening there when it comes to climate change, but I really want you to you know, be the one to elaborate on that matter and explain to us what climate change looks like for the people of Zimbabwe and how their lives are you know, threatened when it comes to this issue. So uh, when we talk about climate change in Zimbabwe, it's, it's, it's um, it's, it's a topic that I, I'm not impressed to discuss about because uh, we have lost a number of lives, human lives. For example, uh, last year we were affected by Cyclone Idai. Uh, quite a number of people went missing. Up to now, they cannot be found. Uh, a lot of homes were swept away. Uh, valuable resources were lost. Uh, lives were lost. Uh, because it's something which happened an away. And uh, last year, again, we had a severe drought. Uh, and the previous year, we actually had a drought. Actually, we're expe expecting a drought this year again. So when we talk about droughts, the issue leads to food insecurity, uh, malnutrition, uh, food production, 
And um, these are some of the issues that we are currently facing here in Zimbabwe because uh, if we talk about drought, it means it's affecting water quantity, uh, at times water quality. So it means the lives of people are at stake here. And according to the UN report, which was established last year, 5.5 million people here in Zimbabwe are food insecure. So it's really a sad situation, uh, something that really needs each and every individual uh, to participate and come up with innovative ideas on how we are going to feed the nation, how we are going to provide clean water uh, with this global crisis that we are currently facing, how we are going to make sure that children are not suffering from malnutrition and um, amongst other diseases and stuff. So this is the situation of, um, of the climate crisis here in Zimbabwe, um, yeah. You know, when I hear such things, it really makes me so sad to think that there are people who say that we still have time and yet there are people who are already dying. Personally, I believe that we lost time already. The moment people started dying as a result of climate change, the moment people's dreams, hopes, started getting destroyed and affected. That is the time when everything was done for us. So if we need to take action, the action needs to be taken now, not 20 years later or 30 years later, because there are so many people suffering in uh, various parts of the world. And as you've said in Zimbabwe, many people are you know, facing an issue of food insecurity. That literally counts for almost every African country because most of the African countries heavily depend on agriculture, they depend on natural resources. So if the food is affected, what are these people going to eat? You know, many people just get the statistics of you know how uh, people are affected in uh, maybe some countries in Africa. The, in this case, I'll use Zimbabwe like the cyclone you talked about. We just talked at seeing it in the news, but did we follow up to see what happened to those people after losing their homes, after losing their farms, after losing their children, their husbands, their wives, and literally their everything? What happened to these people? Do they have access to food? Do they have places to stay? I feel like these are conversations that are usually left out, you know, in the in this climate movement, people need to understand that there are people who are suffering so much right now. And the world, I mean, the people in power, the people who have the authority and the resources need to do something now, not 10 years later or 20 years later, because you've clearly explained what is happening in Zimbabwe and people are suffering right now. And they didn't suffer, they didn't start suffering um, right now. They started way back. And we need to address those issues with more you know, energy so that the world understands what is really happening in the countries that are most affected by the climate crisis. Yes, uh, yes, you're yeah, right. Uh, like I also said, um, each and every individual has a role to play, directly or indirectly. So you find out that we have uh, places we call wetlands. We have people that are constructing at wetlands because they, I'm not sure if they do not understand uh, the importance of wetlands. So what happens is when a flood comes, those wetlands, they can actually assist in, you know, in reducing the impacts or the effects of a certain flood because they act as sponges, they absorb all that water. But when we manipulate the wetlands, uh, when we construct on wetlands, it means that when a flood comes, we are easily affected. So issues to do with um, climate action, it goes on to the last person, even the last person being affected. You should also understand that you can do something about it. And we also need decision leaders, political leaders to take active action. I mean, to, to drive these conversations, not to wait for young people uh, to come and bring solutions, but they should drive these conversations, um, support young people that are coming up with good ideas, support young people that are doing good job in climate mitigation, uh, fighting for their voices, fighting for other rural communities uh, so that they they can protect themselves 
uh, they can actually be able to secure themselves when it comes to food. They can actually have clean and safe water to drink uh, in times of a crisis. You know, you talked about something about um, building in wetlands and that made me, that just reminded me of something. So um, what you're trying to say is that we cannot have development without addressing the issue of climate change because the two are interrelated. But um, many times people have an issue of uh, choosing um, development that is destroying the planet. And yet I certainly believe that there is a way that we can have development that is sustainable enough while protecting our planet and our leaders need to understand that there are new ways there are new paths to development and they need to forsake everything that is causing damage or danger to our planet because i mean this is our home this is you know it's our responsibility to take care of it and i really i really condemn the people who building wetlands um cut down trees for construction of roads or any kind of infrastructure. It is so disturbing. Yes, uh, I would love to agree because if we are really serious of achieving the Agenda 2030, which are the sustainable development goals, then we need to start thinking green. Even our development should be green. It should be sustainable development. So that is quite important. Uh, it, it is not a matter of just developing nowadays, but is that development, whatever initiative that one is driving, is it going to be sustainable? Uh, is it not going to cause a lot of environmental degradation or environmental damage? So this is, um, this is quite important. And these are some of the issues that we go into the school and teach uh, young children about sustainable development, their importance. Uh, goal number 13, its importance and how they should have, uh, they should be innovative in coming up with uh, solutions and ideas for their country, sustainable solutions it is, which we can actually support and um, also get the government to support their ideas so that um, we are in a green pathway. Yeah, I, I also personally believe in, I believe in sustainable cities and green building. I believe it's something that our governments can take on to address the issue of climate change. So, um, Elizabeth, do you think that your voice is being heard as an activist? Because uh, according to everything you've told me, you've been doing activism for quite a long time. So I would really like to, do you think your voice is being heard? Okay, so for when I started doing my activities, it was, you know, I was doing it uh, for, because it's something that I'm passionate about. You know, uh, it was not like for recognition, uh, which is why a lot of people don't know me. And uh, also I can say by that time, we're not like fussy about technology, you know, uh, internet, because I'm talking about 2012 when I started doing my initiatives. I think that I was only connected to WhatsApp um, I was not active on the internet, even my Twitter account. I think I just started to be active like one and a half years back or two years back. That's when I started to be active. Um, I've actually worked with other organizations into climate smart agriculture, ETC, and I've done so much work on climate action. But like I said, um, you need to have the resources in order for you, in order for people to hear you because uh, you do not meet ministers now and again, but at times if you are on social media, on social platform, you can actually get to interact with the decision makers and also give your inputs and uh, what you feel and how you feel that particular maybe project is affecting you. So those are some of the resources that I didn't have when I was growing up. Um, but then uh, when I finished my BSc, I started working. Uh, we realized that it was important for us to come up with an organization. And through this organization, that is when our voices started to be heard. And it's also not easy for your voice to be heard because at times when you book an appointment with the government or with the decision makers, they'll tell you that, I know we are busy or they'll just postpone, keep on postponing your meeting. And at times you, 
end up feeling like maybe what you're trying to do is not worth it. But then we kept on pushing till they realized that uh, we had a very good agenda and uh, we had clear objectives. We wanted to engage young people. We wanted to educate and make sure uh, everyone is aware of the climate crisis and how best they can act and tackle it. So that's how um, we began to invest more into technology, Wi-Fi, and we started doing a lot of uh, campaigns on our social media platforms. Even on my uh, on my on my social platforms, I talk a lot about climate action. I don't talk a lot about my life or my whatever I do, but it's always about climate action and uh, sustainable agriculture. Uh, that's what I really talk about. So those are some of the limitations that we have here in Africa. We do not have resources when it comes to good uh, Wi-Fi. At times, we don't have good Wi-Fi. At times, it's actually expensive, especially here in Zimbabwe and in most African countries. Wi-Fi is very, very expensive, and most young people, they cannot afford it. So they miss a lot of opportunities. Their voices are not heard, and uh, it will appear as if they are, doing, they are not doing anything in Africa, but yet we are doing something. Yeah, I, I really agree with you. Um, people need to know that they're actually, you know, young people in Africa, in their uh, specific countries that are doing something, you know, it's just that some of them don't have the opportunity, you know, to be heard or, you know, to speak up or for their voices to be amplified. But hopefully that's something that we can, you know, change and, you um, you know, show the world that people are doing different things, different activists are, you know, involved in certain projects that are helping to address the, the issue of climate change. Yeah, 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 that is true, which is why we are leaving no one behind. Um, we are leaving no one behind. We are going to the rural areas, especially the young people, children and youth, those are our targets uh, because they should know that they have a role to play when it comes to environmental stewardship, uh, environmental conservation. And it is our agenda and our aim not to leave anyone behind when it comes to climate action. We need everyone, everyone is useful, whether you have the resources or not, uh, whatever awareness, whatever campaigns I'm doing on social media, I still have to go into the communities, do the small, do the small I can with the little resources that I have, so that um, everyone is aware of the effect on the effect of climate of climate change. So, um, would you like to you know give a message to the young people who are doing activism? those in the various, you know, movements like uh, Fridays for Future, Extinction Rebellion, you know, polluters out. I mean, would you like to give them a message if you were to talk to them and maybe uh, give them advice in some way, what would you tell them? I think it is also time as young people, climate activists, to do things from the heart to be passionate about what we are doing, um, not to be so much concerned about what media thinks or to be so much concerned about which conference I'm going to travel to, which country I'm going to travel to. I have realized that uh, the movement at times is lacking genuine people, real people that are doing these initiatives from the bottom of their hearts. Those are the people that we want because we know that whether they have the resources or they do not have the resources, um, they are still on track and they'll continue pushing for environmental justice, for climate justice. So it is good to do things from the heart and it is also good to pay particular attention to the vulnerable communities and, um, uh, and to listen and to learn from our indigenous knowledge, because I always say that all this while we, we, we had wetlands, we had trees, but our forefathers, our grandmothers, they had a way they would conserve and protect these species. But then we came, our generation, we came and we don't even understand what these trees are. And uh, we are so much concerned about new technologies, but it is also good that you have that technology, that information, 
and also understand where you're coming from, the indigenous knowledge system, so as to protect and conserve our environment. I agree with you. We need honesty in the climate movement because with the honesty, that is the only way that we'll be able to achieve everything that we want to achieve. And you talked about something very interesting, indigenous knowledge. Um, I personally believe that um, indigenous people have had a way of preserving uh, forests, animals, plants with their own knowledge. For example, um, personally, my country, I come from Uganda, we have uh, different tribes. And um, personally, I, I come from the Buganda tribe. And with the Buganda tribe, um, they name people after animals or um, plants or trees or, you know, and they also give totems. And um, with this totem, you cannot, you cannot eat your totem. Yeah, it's, it's like, uh, it's just something that was built by those people who are there before us. And I believe that this is indigenous knowledge that has been able to preserve some of the things that we still see right now. And uh, I believe in the power of listening to what the indigenous people have to say mm -hmm. and to also integrate their knowledge in the solution that you know, we need uh, to address climate change. So I don't know, what would you talk about that when it comes to uh, respecting the rights of indigenous people and as well as respecting the knowledge that they have used for over a hundred years to preserve the ecosystem that we are seeing right now? So indigenous people, I can say they are custodians of the environment. They have managed to preserve uh, this forest. I mean, we actually have indigenous people in Australia uh, that were able to preserve their forest, you know, and uh, if, 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 if you would want to understand what really actually happened in Australia is, uh, I think there was a time when those indigenous people, they were like chased, removed from their place they used to stay and they were like removed. And which, is, which explains why they started having those fires because they actually had a way of protecting those forests. They actually could tell uh, the time when the forest would be affected by wildfires and they would come up with solutions for the wildfires not to continue. So like I said, it is actually good for us to remember, take a moment and reflect how these issues were being conserved back then, how the, how the rivers, how the dams, uh, we're being conserved, the forest, our biodiversity, how was it being conserved? Uh, actually, the example that you gave, we also do the same here. Like if I'm to translate my totem in English, I'll be a monkey. Uh, it means that um, uh, if I'm a monkey, uh, my totem, if it's a monkey, I'm not supposed to be seen killing a monkey because it's my totem. So it's a way uh, our people, our traditional people who try to conserve and protect our, our biodiversity. But now, because we think like maybe that information is no longer good to uh, is no longer good for us because um, uh, we are using a lot of technology. We have lost quite a number of species. Uh, we are facing biodiversity uh, biodiversity loss. Uh, even our agriculture is not sustainable agriculture yet. The indigenous people though practice sustainable agriculture. I remember when you were growing up, we would hear about conservation agriculture which was later on modified to climate smart agriculture, one of the components of climate smart agriculture. I mean, these are the things that they would do to try uh, to protect uh, their soils, their water, but at the same time, getting food from the soil, um, but in a sustainable manner. So it is actually good and important that we try to integrate the science that we have and the indigenous knowledge systems that we have, because before we know it, the indicators, the indigenous um, indicators uh, that were used back then, they'll go extinct. And it will be difficult for us to predict some of the issues. Like from where I come from, it was easy for the indigenous people to predict that we'll be having a drought maybe next year because maybe there'll be uh, the, the direction uh, of birds, it, it might have changed. So if birds are supposed to go to the east, and by that particular time, if they fly to the west, they can actually tell that 
these bird species, they're supposed to be going to the east, but this time they are going to the west. So it means that you're going to, to, to have a drought. So if we do not act fast, we might actually, leave, we might actually lose uh, those bird species. They might actually go extinct and it will be difficult for us uh, to predict what is happening through using the indigenous knowledge system. Uh, at the same time, I'm not saying science is not important. We need to listen to the science. But this is also the time when you need each and every player to be on board, appreciating indigenous knowledge system and appreciating the results from the scientists. That's really interesting. Um, just to add something, um, I think I'm learning so much from you and I'm so happy that you are going to do this. <laughs> I think you're really um, an inspiring climate activist you know, someone that I really needed to listen to and someone that the world needs to listen to and learn from. Uh, so from that, um, what does um, a disaster-free future look like for you? Uh, for example, I know we are all working towards a specific future without this disaster, the climate change, when everything is... Now, I'll leave you to explain that. So what does that kind of future look to you? The one that you really want to see, yeah? Uh, the future I want is for young people to be engaged, young people to be given space to speak. I love the energy and the zeal that young people are putting, especially into the climate movement, but it will be also be good if we have other movements, let's say health, uh, having their own movement and other sectors representing different um, uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, at times, young people are usually seen as threats uh, because of the energy they have, they are too vocal. But I think uh, the political leaders uh, they should just try to channel that energy that young people have in the right direction. So it actually becomes easy when it, when it comes to planning, if young people are on the table and if their energy is channeled in the right direction, if they are not being excluded on most important issues. So it is quite important for the, for, for the current generation and our generation to actually work together. Uh, if we work together, it means that uh, we can tackle issues to do with, um, with, with biodiversity and ecosystems. We can tackle issues to do with droughts through innovation. We can tackle issues to do with uh, water quality, uh, land use, even the national adaptation plans. It will be easy for them to you know, link into our policies. Even the green economy that we are talking about, reducing our carbon emissions, uh, it will be easy for us to, to feed in, to play our part as young people if you're given the platforms to. So in other countries, young people, they don't even know how they're supposed to reach out to their government, what their role is in trying to reduce these greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. So it will be easy from the onset, the framework of the policies should include a component of youth. So if the framework of the policies includes a component of youth, it's easy for young people to feed in through their various projects. For example, if someone is doing a project on apiculture, that person can actually understand that, you know, if I'm doing a bee project, I'm actually contributing to my national data mine contributions because I'm reducing the greenhouse gas emissions, I'm conserving and protecting the forest. I, there's no way one would need, there's no way someone who cut the forest if they know they are actually benefiting something that is contributing to their livelihood, that is contributing to their uh, food security, which is honey. So those are the kind of things that we want. And this is the future that I'm actually looking for when governments and decision makers can actually, you know, be flexible to give young people a seat on the table, plan together, work together so that we work and come up with what is good for Africa as a whole. Absolutely, I um, agree with you. And um, you know, we have all these uh, these lockdowns, and many activists don't know how to keep their activism going. So, what do you do, you know, in order to keep your voice speaking, in order to keep people informed? What are you doing, um, especially uh, since we're in this situation? 
how are you doing your climate activism? For example, most young people are not able to you, you know, do the climate strikes because of the lockdowns. So what would you advise them to do? Okay, so because a lot of people are at home, uh, this lockdown gives up the under the foundation. I find that you have been trying out that thing and that you need the next that you need to know what so we I've been trying to advocate for people to save electricity. There's no need to keep on the light uh in a second bedroom if you're not in that bedroom. There's no need to keep on the TV if you're not in the lounge or if you're not in the if you're not in the uh saving water. Some people they just enjoy drinking water, meaning if you're brushing your teeth, someone will just open the sink, uh water will be just uh you know running out, yet you're not even using it. So it would be easy for you to use the tap, close the tap, you know, trying to save water. Exercising is actually good for your health. Exercising is good for your health. Keeping healthy is actually good and recommended by doctors. Uh, doing some activities in your garden, gardening, you know, um, stuff like that. And we've actually, uh, as an organization, we came up with 19 things that someone can do under, under a lot and we've been doing a lot of discussions uh, how uh, COVID-19 is linked to health, how it is linked to climate action, making sure that some people can actually understand that it's not only about the health that is being affected, but also the environment is being affected. And they have a role to play. They can actually get something coming up with innovation ideas and help them, you know, and keep them the pandemic. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. But um, I think we had an issue with the with the sound a bit, and uh, yeah, I couldn't hear you very well. And I really think the young people need to get that advice. You know, yeah, I can hear you, but it is very low. Very low. No, that's perfect. Ah, that's good. So uh, I, I, if you allow me, can I repeat what I just said? Yes, definitely. Okay. So I was saying that uh, you find out that when you're at home, you get to, you know, you don't use uh, some of the resources that you have efficiently. For example, if it is electricity, people tend to waste electricity simply because they're at home. They might just leave the television on, yet they are sitting in another room. They might just leave the lights on, yet they are sitting in other rooms. Uh, so that is quite important. We've been trying to send out the message that please, 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 trying to advocate for efficient energy use, uh, for efficient water use. Uh, people tend to waste water. Where I come from, water is, a, is a, water is very valuable because we hardly have water and our boreholes they've gone dry they do not even have water so we have to you know um travel for a distance of like five kilometers to get clean water so we've been trying to advocate for people to save water to save electricity eating healthy this has been recommended by doctors uh coming up with um with initiative discussions on how COVID 19 is linked to climate related acti to climate action how it's linked to the environment and making sure that young people are aware that at times their effects, uh, at times their actions, at times what they think is unnecessary can actually contribute to this global crisis that we are currently having. So those are the things that we've been doing. We came up with 19 things which you can do uh, under a COVID, under, under a lockdown. Um, uh, we established, we, pu we published that on our social media platforms. So there's quite a number of things that people can do. Could it be exercising, eating healthy, saving electricity, saving water, reading articles, uh, you know, something like that. So we've been trying to keep on the momentum, uh, spreading the word on social media platforms, making sure that in as much as you're focusing on the global crisis, 
uh, we are also trying by all means to conserve and protect our environment. Wow, that's, you know, that's really, really amazing. And I like that you brought a different, you know, version of continuing with, the, with activism in the lockdown. And what is that? That is in our actions at home. For example, um, saving electricity as much as possible and not leaving the lights, you know, the lights on when you're not using them. Actually leaving the lights off for the daytime because you don't need them. And uh, you brought about uh, an issue of wasting water. Yeah, that's really a, a very big problem for most people. For example, um, some people when, when they're brushing, it's, I don't know, it's so hard for them to first lock the tub and, you know, brush and then use it again. They just want the water to keep flowing. And yeah, these people yeah. need to understand that their communities and their countries like yours, Zimbabwe, where water is so valuable and uh, people need to, you know, be more careful and preserve, you know, the things that we have because there are those who can't even access them in the simplest ways possible. And then you talked about the issue of using social media um, to keep your activism going. And uh, I think that's also really great. And um, the, the, uh, the things that you put out um, on your website and your social media to try and help people to, to, you know, to have things that they can do during the lockdown. I like the fact that uh, you've included the issues of uh, addressing climate change and also the issue of, uh, you know, protecting mental health. Because when you tell people they can do exercises, they can read articles, or they can read books. To me, I feel like that's a form of, you know, protecting your mental health and trying as much as possible to keep away from, you know, negative uh, information that is coming from different parts of the world. And people really need to understand that in this situation, we can keep fighting for the planet, but then we also need to protect our mental health and try to be as positive as possible. Yes, uh, yes, that's true. Uh, uh, would you like to maybe give us um, a final word for the leaders, the people in power, the people who have the authority to, you know, implement policies? Yeah. Yes, I think what the people in power need to understand is they are serving the people. So it is not about their own uh, personal decisions, but whatever decisions they are coming up with should have uh, to do with serving the people, serving different communities. Uh, so it is also important for decision makers, political leaders, uh, to come up with good policies, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, and in their policies, they should make it easy for young people to contribute uh, through different activities, through different actions. They should engage uh, creating platforms for young people uh, to contribute uh, whatever initiatives they are into. They should support young people. They should support the communities, the villages who voted for them to be where they are. Uh, they should support them. Um, in African countries, you find out that um, politicians, most politicians, they they are very active when he, when we are when they are approaching election time. You know that's when they remember that there is a community that voted for them. But this should come to an end. Um, it is not only about being elected. You should not do good things because you are now facing an election. You should go. You should do good things throughout your term. You should uh, make sure that these communities are assisted because they are the vulnerable people anyway, and they need our assistance, especially when it comes to agriculture, it's the backbone of Africa. Um, these politicians, the decision makers, they need to make sure that um, people have water, uh, irrigation, um, they have good seeds, you know, uh, they are being educated on how best they can practice sustainable agriculture so as to promote food security uh, in a particular country. 
So these are the issues that I, I would want to tell to the decision makers that continue doing good, whether you're facing an election uh, in, the, in the next season or not, you, you need to serve the people who voted for you. Uh, and we all need to come together and uh, act for the climate and protect our environment. The environment is slowly falling apart and we are not going to act the decision makers, the political leaders, do whatever they are doing. Uh, we are going to try by all means to push the agenda, the climate agenda, so that we get the right answers, we get the right action that we need to reduce the effects of climate change. You know, I completely agree with you because it is the people who put these leaders in power and they put them in power because they expect them to help their communities, to help their families and uh, provide facilities and services that are going to not only secure the present, but also secure the future of these people. So leaders really need to step up their game and uh, do what they ought to do during their terms or you know, their reigns in power. And um, yeah, thank you so much. I, I think we are really coming to the end of this. And um, I'm so sad that Destin um, had an issue probably, I think with the internet, but mm -hmm. hopefully we will have him uh, next time for, for another you know, video and we'll still have to tell his story and yeah, amplify his voice. But yeah. um, nevertheless, I'm so happy that, you know, we had this conversation together. And I believe that many people are going to learn a lot from you. Personally, I have learned a lot from you. There is something so inspirational and um, very educative about how you explain and articulate the issues of climate change. Uh, solutions and how people are really affected. So thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Climate Voices. And um, I think you should share your social media handles uh, with the people watching because they need to they need to listen to you. They need to follow you. They need to see what you're doing. And uh, those who can support you in any way, they need to you know, see what you're doing. Thank you very much, Vanessa, for actually creating this platform for other African climate activists that are doing amazing job. Um, much thanks to you, and this has been um, a very good uh, discussion, actually. I cannot call it an interview. It was a very productive discussion. I actually learned a lot uh, on the issues that you're discussing about, talking about what you're doing uh, in your country. Uh, my social media handles are at Liz Gulas on Twitter. I'm mostly active on Twitter. Um, of course, I have an Instagram page. It's also Liz Gulas. I have a Facebook account which is Elizabeth, um, Ma, Elizabeth Gulugulu Machache. So yeah, um, I would love to hear from everyone. Um, like I said, if you have not yet started, to, if you have not joined the movement, it's not too late to be part of the climate movement. There's a lot of materials online that you can read about, you can learn, you can educate yourself, uh, and you can start educating other people. So please join on the climate movement. It really needs each and every person. Uh, and every one of us. Thank you so much and um, special appreciation to our viewers. Thank you so much for taking your time to watch this conversation with Elizabeth, a climate activist from Zimbabwe. Uh, don't forget to share it with your contacts with the uh, different people because the main aim is to tell the story of uh, every climate activist from the different parts of the world and don't forget to subscribe on the youtube channel because this will help us reach more people and uh, tell more stories thank you for watching and thank you elizabeth much thanks vanessa mm -hmm.